Hey guys, it's Ted Bogert. Welcome back to the Ted Show, my favorite series that we have on the Ted Show, and that is Heroes Always Welcome. It's a veteran-centric show where we spotlight, highlight uh, veterans in our community, active military, their families. We really are focusing on uh, having them share their journey and their story with us because, as all of you have told me, it's motivating, inspiring, and a lot of times it sends a light bulb up there and gives you an idea of what you can do when you transition out of the military. Uh, maybe you've got an entrepreneurial spirit, you want to be in real estate, you name it, any of those things. If you sit and talk to my co-host, the one and only Enrique Acosta Gonzalez, and then our special guest, Mark Katie Archia. As I uh, try to figure out my lighting here. Sorry. Oh, you look good. You look good. All right. So welcome, gentlemen. How are you today? Great. Great. Thank you. Good. All right. So I'm happy to have you, Mark, and we'll get to you in a minute, but I have to uh, introduce my co-host with the most, the one and only Enrique Acosta Gonzalez. Good morning, Enrique. Good, Tell him about good morning, Ted. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this day where we highlight veterans. This is one of my favorite days of the week. Uh, most call it Monday. I call it Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's amazing uh, how all of this uh, is you know, it's coming together to highlight veterans. So thanks for having me, Ted, and uh, thanks for joining us, Mark. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, so, Enrique. Absolutely. All right. So, Enrique, before we get to Mark, tell them just a little bit about you. I've got triadleadershipsolutions.com scrolling across the bottom of your screen there, and that is part of you. So tell them a little bit. Yeah, well, thank you for doing that. Triad Leadership Solutions is a, a consulting firm where we focus on leadership development, uh, primarily on the inner workings of leadership. Uh, a lot of people try to patch the things that happen on the outside. We target the things that are happening on the inside. So yeah, thanks for uh, highlighting that. Absolutely. All right. So without further ado, we bring an old friend on the show for the first time. Uh, Mark Katie Archia is here with us and Mark's going to share his journey Welcome, Mark. Excited to have you. Thank you for your service. I got to say that a bunch of times oh, on the show because I really feel it. Um, before we went live, I told you that the audience loves to know about you, kind of your journey. So uh, Enrique and I will pop in with questions, but we'd love you to kind of give us a point A to point B uh, as much wow. as you want to share. There's a part. Journey. There's a point A <laughs> and a part point B, and there's a point A plus and a part <laughs> B minus. It's been quite a journey. Um, so uh, you you said you started off at old friend, and I don't quite know how to take that. Um, I just turned fifty eight <laughs> a week ago. Uh, so <laughs> you look great, and and so uh, anybody yes, yes. knows uh, when Ted and I met just a couple of years ago, I had hair. I don't have hair anymore. That's what this friendship has done. No, I'm kidding. You know, do you know how many people would go? Oh, I get it, Mark. I totally understand that. <laughs> Well, so um, uh, again, thank you very much for both of you for inviting me and asking me to be a part of this today. And I, I certainly hope that my story uh, will uh, provide some inspiration. Um, so, wow. All right. So 58 years ago, uh, I was a week old. Uh, I was born in Jacksonville, so I'm a, a, a Navy veteran um, and a Florida native. Uh, my father worked for the Department of Corrections, so we lived all over the state of Florida. Many of you might remember Ted Bundy. Uh, my father was his counselor when he was on death row. No. Um, and But we lived in multiple places across the state, and eventually uh, we moved to DeLand in my senior year. I went to three different high schools now figure out what that was like in my head. Um, but I graduated in DeLand. Uh, Deland Senior High School in 1982, and in uh, that was in June, and then in July, on July 5th, 1982, I went into the Navy and went to boot camp right here in Orlando at RTC Orlando, which uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with that, uh, that is now Baldwin Park and is represented by Blue Jacket Park, which is a city park. Uh, it's where the USS Blue Jacket, which was a wooden ship, 
um, was uh, on the north end of what we refer to as the grinder. <clears throat> it was also our graduation field. So when you go to Blue Jacket Park, that is actually where we did our um, graduation parade. Uh, it was right there. When I went into um, the Navy, uh, I was planning on becoming a minister, a Southern Baptist minister. And so I went in as a religious program specialist uh, at the age of 17. I graduated from boot camp, went to, um, went to A school at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, in Gulfport in Biloxi. And then was uh, when, the, <laughs> uh, when, when the controller called and said, okay, we're gonna give everybody their assignments um he was rattling off all these ships for everybody and finally he came to me and he said uh seaman recruit katie uh what do you think about the uh u.s naval hospital okinawa and i thought for a moment i said you didn't say uss and he said no i didn't i said i'll take it <laughs> So at, uh, at the age of 17, um, I flew off to Okinawa, Japan. Uh, I got there in November of 1982, um, uh, a month and two days before uh, my 18th birthday. And I will tell <laughs> God bless my sponsor and the two chaplains that I worked with, because when they caught wind that a 17-year-old kid <laughs> was coming <laughs> over to operate their chapel, to run their chapel programs at the Naval Hospital, but then also uh, an on-base hospital. Um, they were like, oh, this is not gonna be good. This is just not gonna be good. And, um, you know, we had some really, really great times uh, while I was there. I did my entire active duty stint at the U.S. Naval Hospital in Okinawa, Japan. Wow. Um, I extended uh, twice and uh, took advantage of the additional 30 days leave that they provided us um, so that I could come home for longer periods of time uh, when I wanted to do that. But during the time uh, at the Naval Hospital and being in Okinawa, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of the host nationals. And certainly my job as a religious program specialist was to provide support for all chapel programs. So that meant uh, Roman Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Protestant, all the different religions. And uh, I grew up in a household where my mother is Italian. She was raised Catholic. My father is uh, was from New England, excuse me, and he was Baptist. But my mother converted to Roman, I mean, to Southern Baptist or Baptist when my parents got married because my father didn't understand the Latin mass and yada, 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 so on. So um, I kind of had some of that Catholic upbringing and used to go to Catholic mass when I went to Pittsburgh to visit the Italian side of the family. And it just made sense to me. Um, and so I converted from Southern Baptist to Roman Catholic and then plan to become a Catholic priest, a Franciscan. Um, also at the time that I was in the service, I um, had a singing career. Um, I sang in choirs and all that here in Florida. But then when I went to Okinawa, the chaplains caught wind that I could sing. And so they started saying, well, you got to sing at this service, you have to do this. And then the chief petty officers dinner theater. And I started singing at that. And so I ended up doing in the three and a half years that I was in Okinawa, over 20 concerts. Wow. Um, and uh, in Okinawa, in mainland Japan and uh, in the United States. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, a lot of stuff was going on between the age of 17 and 21. Uh, I left there in May of 1986, uh, or in June, I should say, and came back to uh, the Naval Training Center to do my, you know, getting out 
all that stuff. I stayed in the independent ready reserves, but then I uh, signed up for the reserves, uh, for the Navy reserves. So I was with a fleet hospital um, out of Jacksonville. And uh, then the best time that I had was with the Seabees. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Seabees are the Marine wannabes. And uh, we had a blast. And I operated um, nine uh, chapel programs uh, across because I was with the battalion and we had different detachments from Puerto Rico to North Carolina. And so I was responsible for running all of those chapel programs. Um, so let's go back to my conversion to Roman Catholic and planning on becoming a priest, a Franciscan priest. Um, I uh, was, uh, I got affiliated with the province out of Pittsburgh, which is the St. Augustine province, was going to go to seminary in Wycliffe, Ohio at St. Charles Borromeo. And then something happened. Yeah, do sure. Um, yeah, so um, I had sex for the first time. I was 21. And I said, oh, I kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fair enough. <laughs> but here's the, I'm really going to throw this for a loop. But it wasn't sex with a woman. It was with a guy. And um, I came to a real quick understanding that I was gay uh, and that I was suppressing all of that, those feelings, those desires, by saying, I'm going to become a priest. And I didn't have to answer anybody's questions about why I wasn't dating. Hmm. So that was kind of my workaround. Um, so then I decided not to go into seminary and stayed in the service. Of course, at that particular time, you could say nothing about being gay. I remember I had a friend, uh, his name is Paul Hine, um, in the Navy. Uh, and I found out that he was gay and we never spoke about it. Never ever ever spoke about it years later well there was a time when we were in smugglers cove which was the bar behind the barracks and he asked me on one occasion what would you do if a gay guy approached you and i said i would knock his head off you will never forget it that well that was that was the rule then i mean that was you could not say anything back then in the military at all, no, didn't even no. hint at it. Mm -hmm. And working at a naval hospital, where fifty percent of the people that are working in the hospital—the nurses, the corpsmen, the doctors—are gay, but nobody spoke about it. It was just not talked about. So uh, when I came out in Daytona Beach at the Zodiac Bar, uh, I was standing at the bar, and I got this tap on my shoulder, and it was Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and he said you hypocrite I'll, I'll never forget it and uh we have we have uh maintained a friendship over all these years and uh he and his husband uh live in uh texas and they adopted uh, a, a child who has just graduated from high school and is uh, just doing great things but anyway so that was you know kind of my coming out if you will and uh, I continued with my career in singing, um, but as a chaplain's assistant, all of the training that I had was administrative. And my first job, um, other than working in a McDonald's uh, when I got out, was with Donnelly Information Publishing, which was a sister of Donnelly Directory. You all remember the yellow pages. Yeah. And uh, I was hired uh, by Charlie Oswald um, in customer service. And, uh, I remember you're out of the, you're out of the Navy now. No, I was still in the reserves. Mm -hmm. So I was so, still in the reserves. Um, so I did my, you know, two weeks, uh, every year and I did, uh, my weekend, you know, I was a weekend warrior. Right. And, uh, but on the side, I continued to sing and perform and, and things like that. I eventually opened up my own entertainment company 
And uh, I was a subcontractor for Disney. Uh, I had the opportunity to open for Elton John, um, uh, sang with the Commodores, just did a lot of stuff. So I had my entertainment. How, how, is that how we, did we meet, where did we meet? It, this is all coming back to me. Because we I think met. we met at the chamber, didn't we? We met at the Valley National Bank um, event See, that they remembers. had at, oh, I will never forget you because I saw you up there and <laughs> glitter and everything. I thought, oh my God, what is here? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, okay. I didn't mean it to bring it to me. I just, I was thinking in my mind, where is it that we yeah, met? So that's, that's um, where we met. And I thought, oh, I have to meet this one. So <laughs> I wonder how many other people have that feeling. I, it's fascinating. I'll have to do a poll. Yeah. So, um, so, so the entertainment part, did that become um that's your was that your career path post navy or it was uh i uh, love to sing i love to perform but it was also um a way that my that i felt accepted by my father my father loved to listen to me sing he loved to uh, see me perform he loved when the audience applauded and they would roar with applause, he, he, my it was made my dad very very proud. In 1999, my father died on November 9th, which also happened to be the anniversary of the day that I landed in Okinawa. Um, and November 9th of 1999, I sang at my father's funeral, wow. and I gave up my career in performing. And uh, also during that time, I was working part time uh, with Watermark, which is the LGBTQ news source for Central Florida as their sales director. Um, and uh, then eventually got hired away by Orlando Weekly to develop their classified advertising department. And then was hired away by Philadelphia City Paper, uh, where they asked me to come up there and do the same thing that I did here in Orlando with their classified department. Here in Orlando, they were doing about a half a million dollars a year when I started. In nine months, we turned that into a million dollars in revenue. When I went to Philadelphia, they were doing about a million dollars a year cash that was all adult advertising because that was the bread and butter for alternative news weeklies. Um, but I transitioned that into employment advertising, real estate, mind, body, and spirit to other lucrative um, revenue sources and took a department from one individual at a million dollars a year cash to two and a half million dollars a year with six salespeople uh, and did that within two years. I want to... Let me ask you, uh, the tr we talk a lot on the show about transitioning out of the service. Um, mm -hmm. It's and I want to I want to talk about that. And yours has an added layer to it. Um, transitioning out of the service into civilian life. Um, was that difficult for you in general? And do you feel like as a gay man, it was more difficult? Um, did, you, did the people around you outside uh, know uh, that you are gay, like how, because a lot of times the, the heroes come on and they talk about, about the transition out. It's hard to go from being military into a crazy uh, rat race that we have in corporate America. And right. I'm curious to see if yours was um, more or less difficult because you had a lot more going on when you got out of the Navy. Mm -hmm. It was. Uh, it was a difficult transition coming from military life um, and Enrique, you'll really appreciate this. Um, you get stereotyped and pigeonholed very quickly. Uh, even to this day, um, people will make reference. Oh, well, you're so strict about this because that's your military upbringing or that's your military background. No, it's not. Uh, that's just the way that I was raised. Mm -hmm. uh, my military background certainly plays an important role in developing teams 
because you can do nothing successfully in the military unless you do it as a team. That's what they taught us in boot camp, right? So you move together, you either win together or you lose together. And um, so that was, uh, uh, I forget where I was going with that. In my well, I, th I think the transition <laughs> out of the military um, for a lot of uh, military, folks that have come on the show or people that I know it just just like you said you go from trusting your brothers and sisters it's a it's it's a life or death kind of trust and then mm -hmm. you come out into corporate America and you're you're pigeonholed uh, you also don't have that kind of trust that camaraderie generally isn't right. there when you get out and so you're having to build it up and that's sort of what that's another veteran walking by that's sort yeah, of yeah. what um what uh enrique does works with leaders um and he i'll let him tell that but i feel like that's where a lot of um veterans get lost they come out yeah. they uh they don't know what to do they don't know how to transition that training that they have out into mm -hmm. corporate america and so that's where that lost missing the military missing the structure comes into play and I'll, you know, I'll let sure. him, that's his expertise. But I'll let him talk a little bit about that. Yeah. yeah Mark, I, I, I thank you first of all, for sharing your story. Um, I think yeah. we're in a time in life that you can actually do that a lot easier and still there is some hesitation at times, mm -hmm. uh, in the company that you're in, because even, uh, you know, even now today, although it is been, um, sanctioned and everything is good there's still some hesitation even in the military to share your life right absolutely uh, and it's so hard but we uh, you know it's funny i hear your your story and i'm like yep that's me yep that's me yep that's me <laughs> we both came in the military we both got shipped uh I, for, you know we both went to orlando right so i came to orlando rtc uh oh. if you haven't been to baldwin park you need to go it's a beautiful blue jacket uh, monument there with the uh, with another statue beautiful thing that navy league has done here in central florida but got both shipped to the west pack right mm -hmm. <laughs> you made it all the way to okinawa i stopped at hawaii i think i was the smartest <laughs> <one there. laughs> well i'm so sorry to hear that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it sounds awful well, enrique well we both served at keesler wow. I, I served at keesler as well uh, and I had some time with the CBs as, as well. So it, it's well, funny I mean, how it's a lot of people have similarities until you meet and, and share this. But, you know, your transition um, at the time was not the same as today. Right. And and you talk right. about uh, a difference in mindset for a nation mm -hmm. uh, when you transition. So it was like totally harder yeah. <laughs> at your time exactly. than it is today. And it still remains to be hard. Sure. So um, you mentioned, you know, uh, getting orders to Okinawa and you could imagine what those were thinking. Oh, here comes a 17 year old to do this job. Um, there's there's a, a program that we have in the military, which is called the sponsorship program. Mm -hmm. Sponsors are waiting. Yep. Ready. They've been there. They know the ground. You don't have to worry about uh, navigating certain kind of waters. You still have your personality to kind of like yeah. develop. But um do you see something similar happening in the workforce for military coming in? Or how do you feel about the potential of a sponsorship program at corporations that would ease the transition a little better? You know, I think that's a great idea. I'm going to give a shout out to Gail Snowville, who was my sponsor when I got to Okinawa. And he and I are still uh, close friends. I uh, have been out to um, visit him and his wife, Terry, uh, out in California. And uh, it was really, really great to see him. But um, I, I absolutely agree. I think that not just for military individuals transitioning out, I think that's a great idea that corporations would do that veteran to veteran uh, because our experience is very, very different. 
Right. But I think that um, that would be a very valuable opportunity for all corporations to assign a sponsor to a new employee, to bring them in, to get them acclimated to the mission and how things work. They will always have a, a person to go to, uh, to ask questions because, you know, it can be very, very intimidating when you go to work for a new employer, right? Um, and that would help to ease that transition for a new employee, for a new hire. I think it'd be a great idea. Um, but yes, my, my sponsor was, uh, was very, very important to me. I remember, uh, of course, in Okinawa, steering wheels are on the opposite side and they drive <laughs> on the opposite side of the road. And the first thing that I did when he had a van that was, he had bought from a, a Marine and it was painted camouflage. <laughs> and then I ended up buying it when Gail left. I bought it and drove it. But anyway, I went to get into the van and Gail said to me, are you going to be driving? Because I was getting in on the passenger side, right. which was the driver side over there. So uh, he and I still joke about that to this day. <laughs> That's been a long time. It's been mm, 40 years, 40 years. And now I ended up doing 16 years uh, total. Uh, and when I got out, um, I got out because of Don't Last, Don't Tell. And that's when I became an activist. That was the very first time that I became an activist. I was uh, in Gulfport, Mississippi, uh, doing my two weeks uh, with a bunch of chaplains. Uh, we had just fired the M16s, which, by the way, the very first time I ever shot an M16, I got marksman. So don't mess with me okay <laughs> anyway hey you because, can shoot and pray for you <laughs> <laughs> because we're the chaplain's bodyguard so we have to carry a yeah. weapon but anyway i remember father Moline listening on his transistor radio and he said they just passed don't ask don't tell and i remember laying on that cot out in the woods saying that's it i'm, I'm done so i turned in my chit asking to go into the IRR. The chaplain said, why? I told him why. He said, you know, we're not supposed to talk about that. And I said, I know. He sent it on to the XO. The XO offered me an advancement in pay grade. I was a 4-0 sailor. I was running all of these chapel programs across the battalion. And he said, why are you doing this, Petty Officer Katie? And I said, because I'm gay and I don't agree, but don't ask, don't tell. Bill Clinton compromised with the GOP um, when he said he was going to allow us to serve openly, and then they compromised with don't ask, don't tell. And uh, I said, if he's willing to compromise that when it comes to me, what else is he willing to compromise when it comes to my safety? So um, he said, OK, we are not going to discuss this because I'm going to tell you something. The CEO will kick you out. And I said, all right, no problem. So he sent it on to the CO, the CO signed off on it, and it was never discussed. I am now a 50% disabled veteran. And uh, I thank God that the chaplain and the, um, uh, um, the XO watched out for me. Thank God, because back in that time, it could have gone a completely... I would have gotten oh. a, an other than honorable right. discharge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I hate to wrap it up. Yeah. I think we're going to have to do a part two because I am going to be kicked out of where I'm at. Okay. Uh, they're, all, they're all staring at me in the glass. Um, Mark, any parting words of wisdom? Any way, if, if, if somebody's watching the show and they want to reach out to you, uh, maybe share what you're comfortable with. Obviously, you're on social media. Sure. Um, how they can find out more about you. Sure. They can certainly find me on LinkedIn. They can find me on Facebook. Um, they can also reach out to me uh, via email at mcastrategies at gmail.com. Um, and I'd be happy to speak with them. But, you know, there is a lot more to my story. Uh, I am also in recovery. So I just want to say this to any veteran out there that may be struggling, particularly at the holidays, uh, remember that you will feel differently 24 hours from now. So give yourself the time that you need. Um, and uh, sometimes it's not just one day at a time, but it's one minute 
at a time. Sure is. And if you can get past this next minute, you can get past the next. So I'll leave you with that. Wonderful. Beautiful. Well, and we're going to bring you back on for part two. I think you have a lot more to share. <laughs> and thank you. Just like I want to echo what Enrique said. Thank you for sharing that. I was hoping you would share that, uh, but I did. Obviously, I was going to leave it all up to you to do that. Uh, and thank I think you. it's very brave and very honorable and um, means a lot that you shared it on the show. Um, Merry Christmas to you both and to your families. Yes. Merry, Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas to everyone out there. Please heed what Mark said. Um, that is so important. And right now I've had a couple of veterans reach out to me already this week. Um, and so the, the mindsets there, the, they are stroke. There's people struggling. It's not just vets, but mm -hmm. definitely struggling. So heed what Mark had to say, reach out to any of us. If you're having that feeling, please. Uh, there's also 988. There's all sorts yes. of numbers yes. you can dial. Uh, but God bless you all. Thank you both for being on the show. We'll see Thank you next time. And okay. we'll have to have Mark. Katie Archia back on the show soon. All right, guys.